Jacob Blake with Attorney Patrick Cafferty by Zoom without objection. All right, thank you, uh, thank you. You are seeing for the very first time images of Jacob Blake since that fateful day where he was shot by police. Answering questions, not in handcuffs, but still in a hospital bed and unable to walk since he was shot seven times in the back. A case sparking a firestorm of anger. Speaking of firestorms, President Trump forcefully pushing back against a report claiming he made insulting comments about fallen American troops, allegedly calling them losers. His rival Joe Biden highlighting his son's service and saying, if this story is true, Trump should not be commander in chief. Holiday warning, health officials sounding the alarm. What happens this weekend could set the course for the fall. All this as COVID cases continue to climb on college campuses. Campuses. The ABC News exclusive inside the NRA, a fired executive speaking out, saying gun owners would be horrified by what happens behind closed doors and accusing the NRA of having blood on its hands. Nation on edge, the city of Portland bracing for what could be 100 straight nights of protests after U.S. Marshals killed an Antifa demonstrator wanted for the murder of a pro-Trump supporter. While in New York, the police union defending those seven officers suspended in the death of Daniel Prude as protests continue in Rochester. Britney Spears, one of the biggest pop stars on the planet. What court documents reveal about her finances and who may have control over them. And good evening, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. It's the unofficial end of summer now. The Labor Day weekend is upon us and a time for all of us to hopefully finally unwind after a very stressful year. As we so often see, today was noticing a familiar scene of packed beaches. This is Jersey Shore. And in bars, we are seeing similar pictures, people maskless and shoulder to shoulder. This is near the University of South Carolina. But here's the problem. Our grim reality is the U.S. is now reporting more than 187,000 people that have died. The CDC is projecting another 30,000 COVID deaths before October. And the concern is these packed places may create a new spike in cases that may be harder to contain as we enter the fall. We have a lot to get to on this Friday, but we begin with our Marcus Moore in Miami Beach on the holiday virus warning and what you can do to try and stay safe. Tonight, the kickoff to Labor Day weekend. Three days, experts warn, are critical in determining how this country battles the virus this fall. New Jersey today taking a big step, reopening indoor dining and movie theaters at limited capacity, but the governor with a blunt warning. We will not tolerate any violations and we will not be afraid to come down hard and make an example of those who think the rules don't apply to them. So much at stake in Nevada, Melanie Saragossa is staying close to home. I think it's going to go up because it seems like it happens every holiday. Doctors urging Americans to avoid the behaviors that triggered a spike in coronavirus cases after Memorial Day and 4th of July. The Surgeon General on GMA. Uh, during these holidays, people come together for barbecues, for picnics. They travel. And, and that sets us up for spread of a highly contagious disease like COVID-19. There is worry about the risk of indoor spread at get-togethers or the spread in bars, like this crowded one at the University of South Carolina, just one of at least 10 schools with more than 1,000 students already infected. Dr. Anthony Fauci warning that several Midwestern states are now at risk of a surge. We don't want to see a surge under any circumstances, but particularly as we go on the other side of Labor Day, the president suggesting there could be a vaccine by Election Day. We remain on track to deliver a vaccine before the end of the year and maybe even before November 1st. We think we could probably have it sometime during the month of October. But his own vaccine chief, Dr. Monsef Slaoui, cautioning a vaccine by Election Day is possible, but very unlikely. We may have enough vaccine by the end of the year to immunize probably, I would say, between 20 and 25 million people. And then we will ramp up the manufacturing to immunize the U.S. population by the middle of 2021. Tonight, early research on Russia's vaccine published in The Lancet found it triggered an antibody response and had no serious adverse effects. That vaccine launched before the final phase three trial was completed. But while Americans wait for a safe vaccine, Jose Guerrero has reason to celebrate this holiday weekend. After six months in the hospital battling the coronavirus, he finally went home. 
And Marcus Moore joining us now from Miami Beach. The governor there keeping uh, beaches across the state open this holiday weekend. But if anything is being done where you are to ensure social distancing or try to keep people safe, tell us about it. Well, Kira, I mean, there's a lot being done, and certainly uh, Florida is one of the, the top locations this weekend for visitors, and they just put up new signs along Miami Beach encouraging people to practice social distancing and also to wear a mask. And, and we learned today from Miami Beach police that they, over the last several weeks, have handed out 800 tickets to people for not wearing a mask. I'll tell you what, uh, knowing you the way I do, you may be spending the weekend there, of course, offering to work, but also allowing yourself maybe <laughs> a little time off. It's been a long week for you, Marcus. It has been a long week, my friend. And uh, yeah, I I'm going to stay in the AC, though. I have to tell you that. <laughs> OK, very good. Marcus Moore, thanks so much. <laughs> Now to the 2020 campaign firestorm and President Trump fiercely denying a damning report claiming he made insulting comments about fallen American troops and those who volunteer to serve. The Atlantic quoting anonymous sources saying the president referred to them as suckers and losers. A furious Joe Biden saying if the comments are true, President Trump isn't fit to be commander in chief, but the White House is pushing back. Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Joe Biden came out today with his angriest denunciation of Donald Trump yet, pointing to an article in The Atlantic alleging that the president referred to American war dead as suckers and losers. If the article is true and it appears to be based on other things he said, it is absolutely damnable. It is a disgrace. It is so un-American. It is so unpatriotic. The article, based entirely on anonymous sources, portrays the president as someone with contempt for military service. It describes a November 2018 trip to France. The president was supposed to visit a World War I cemetery where American troops are buried. But the White House canceled the visit, saying bad weather made it impossible for the president's helicopter to fly. The Atlantic article alleges Trump said, why should I go to that cemetery? It's filled with losers. The president heard about the story while in Air Force One last night. As soon as he landed, he summoned reporters to the dark tarmac and angrily denied it all. I would be willing to swear on anything that I never said that about our fallen heroes. Multiple people who were with the president on the France trip, including Trump critic John Bolton, said today on the record that they never heard the president call dead American troops suckers or losers. Joe Biden said he finds the story believable because of the president's past comments, including what he said in 2015 about John McCain. He's not a war hero. He's a war hero. He's a war Five hero. And a half years He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. And Biden said the allegations in the article show Trump is not fit to be commander in chief. How would you feel if you had a kid in Afghanistan right now? How would you feel if you lost a son, daughter, husband, wife? The president firmly denied the story again today, saying those who serve in the military are heroes. It's a fake story written by a magazine that was uh, probably not going to be around much longer, but it was a totally fake story. And John Carl joins me now from the White House. As you mentioned, John, the claims in this article all came anonymously. But mm -hmm. we're hearing from several current and former Trump officials on the record denying these allegations as well. Yeah, it's a long list, Kira. In fact, the White House has been very aggressive about putting together uh, all the people that were on that trip. Anybody who would have had information would have seen the president on the trip. Uh, they've come up with now 11 different officials, former officials, many of them, uh, saying that they never heard the president say anything like that. I think what's most significant is uh, that one of those includes John Bolton, who obviously is no uh, supporter of the president at this point and is very very willing to say very disparaging things about the president. He says he was there when the decision was made not to visit that cemetery and that he never heard uh, the president say what the Atlantic article says he said. And we all watched the briefing today, the president again denying this story uh, at the press conference. You also asked him about his past remarks where he disparaged John McCain. Um, what did he have to say and what did you make of his response? 
I, I asked him, uh, you know, I, I figured he'd, he'd already been out several times uh, denying this Atlantic story, so I wanted to get in a different aspect of it. I asked if, given all that has happened it's in those five years since he said John McCain is not a war hero, uh, since he said uh, that he preferred people who aren't captured, does he have any regrets uh, for that? And he said that he respected John McCain, but he made it perfectly clear that he has absolutely no regrets whatsoever for saying he's not a war hero, uh, for saying that uh, that he prefers people who aren't captured. He told me, uh, I say what I say. That was his exact quote, I say what I say. And then he added that he thinks that, uh, uh, that he's been proven correct in all of this. So uh, absolutely no regret whatsoever uh, from what he said about John McCain. Um, and Joe Biden also, uh, he reacted quickly to this story uh, coming out of the Atlantic. And his response, uh, very forceful, no doubt, uh, thinking about his son, Bo. Uh, no doubt. You know, Bo uh, obviously served. He, he served uh, during the conflict in Kosovo. Uh, he, uh, he, he served again while he was uh, attorney general of Delaware. Obviously, that is something that, uh, that was kind of fueling uh, Biden's uh, response to all this. But I think it's more than that. I think it was also uh, the genuine friendship that Joe Biden had with John McCain. And I think that, that Biden uh, really found it horrifying uh, the way, uh, the way uh, Trump talked about McCain during the campaign and the way when McCain died, he, re he refused for a time to put the flag down here at the White House. So I, I think that he was in some ways channeling his old uh, Republican friend, John McCain, when you heard that passion in Biden's voice today. Can never deny a war hero, that's for sure. John Carl, sure. thank you so much. Next to the deadly confrontation with a suspected killer in Portland, Oregon, U.S. Marshals shooting and killing an allegedly armed man. Just hours earlier, he appeared in an interview here with Vice, where he basically admitted to killing a pro-Trump supporter, calling it self-defense. The city marks 100 straight days of protests and braces for more this weekend. Our Matt Gutman is there. Tonight, officials in Portland calling the latest violence a tipping point. This is an all-hands-on-deck moment, and I think we would all agree that uh, we need to work collectively um, to stop the violence in Portland. Overnight, U.S. Marshals shot and killed the man wanted in last week's shooting death of a pro-Trump protester. The Marshals swooping in to arrest self-described anti-fascist Michael Raynell in Washington state. It just sounded like 4th of July going off. There was just probably anywhere from 20 to 30 gunshots. Officials say he brandished a gun and tried to flee in his car. There was shots that were fired into the vehicle, and uh, the subject uh, fled from the vehicle, uh, at which time there was uh, additional shots that were fired. Rennell was pronounced dead at the scene. Black Lives Matter! We learned of the shooting as Portland endured its 99th consecutive night of protests. They pushed the crowd back, made uh, what appears to be at least a couple of arrests. Rennell's killing came just hours after Vice News released this interview with him in which he called the killing of pro-Trump activist Jay Danielson self-defense. Totally justified. Had I not acted, I am confident that my friend and I'm sure I would have been killed. Danielson was part of a pro-Trump caravan of vehicles wending through Portland last Saturday, clashing with Antifa and BLM protesters. We're now joined by Matt Gutman, who's live from Portland. Matt, what are you seeing on the streets and what's expected over the holiday weekend? It's pretty calm here right now, Kira. Um, I think it seems like a lot of the protesters, both from uh, Antifa, BLM, and the other side, uh, the Patriot, Patriot Prayers, uh, um, and the other right-wing pro-Trump supporters are resting. Uh, we expect some turbulence tonight, specifically from uh, Antifa and uh, BLM activists who are going to be on the march. But police, when you talk to them, they are bracing for a not insignificant amount of violence. Uh, we just spoke to the head of the police union here, who said that tension are at a boiling point. Uh, and when I asked him what the chances were of this weekend going peacefully, given that there are activists from both sides of the political spectrum uh, flocking into the city, he said slim to none. One interesting thing that he mentioned is that he believes, and I guess a lot of police officers do, that it would really help their cause if the DA allowed them to keep um, the people that they detain and arrest in jail just a little bit longer, make their lives a little bit more complicated. That would be a great deterrent uh, 
uh, from them protesting in the future. Uh, what he says that they're seeing is just this constant rollover of protesters who get uh, detained, released the next day. They're back on the streets within hours. Uh, he hopes that that is something that might stop in the future, Kira. Well, an attorney general, Bill Barr, also weighing in today about the killing of Michael Rynell. Yeah, he called it a takedown. He said that a known Antifa member is going to be off the streets, essentially heralding the work of uh, federal officers, specifically the U.S. Marshals. Um, we don't know if that's the case, right? Because now that a, a member of Antifa, or he described himself as just an anti-fascist, um, has been shot and killed by police, he just joins the ranks of other people who've been shot and killed by police. Uh, there's a lot of anger in the streets about that. Uh, people were just realizing it last night in a protest that we were in. Um, that is a new rallying cry for protesters here. So I'm not sure that's actually going to calm things down, at least here in Portland, Kira. All right, we'll definitely be following it. Matt Gutman, thanks so much. Now to the anger and unrest on the streets of Rochester, New York. Protests growing over the police death of Daniel Prude, pinned down by police until he stopped breathing. Dying days later, seven officers have been suspended, and now the mayor claims her own police department misled her for months about this case. Our Trevor Olt reports. Emotions boiling over on the streets of New York City. Police sources say a counter protester's car drove through a crowd of Black Lives Matter demonstrators who had gathered in Times Square to protest the death of Daniel Prude. There were no injuries and no arrests. Ongoing protests in Rochester, police firing pepper balls and pepper spray to disperse the crowds. At least eight people arrested overnight and two officers injured. These people was out here peaceful protesting on my brother's behalf. And I appreciate their time. I appreciate their compassion. They don't give a damn about that. The, the outrage the sparked by disturbing body camera footage released this week. Put your hands behind your back. Prude Find seen naked back. and in the midst of a mental health crisis when officers say he turned combative, spitting at them. The officers placing a hood over his head, pinning his neck to the ground. The medical examiner later ruling his death a homicide. The mayor suspending seven officers, saying she'd been misled by the police chief. Chief Singletary never informed me of the actions of his officers to forcibly restrain Mr. Prude. Chief Singletary has ordered internal investigations and tonight the police union president saying each of the officers followed protocol the night of the incident and are all cooperating with the investigation. The state attorney general's investigation into Prude's death is ongoing and it appears in anticipation of more protests tonight Rochester police have grabbed riot helmets and barricaded several blocks of city streets. Kira. Trevor, thanks so much. Now to that ABC News exclusive, a former NRA insider ripping the lid of one of the most powerful lobbying groups in the U.S. and its CEO. Joshua Powell was fired from the NRA and is now talking about scathing allegations in his new book out Tuesday. He accuses Chief Executive Wayne LaPierre of using money from the NRA to pay for suits and private jets. Powell also saying the NRA has blood on its hands. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. A former top lieutenant is officially declaring war on perhaps the most powerful and best-known lobbyist in Washington, NRA CEO Wayne LaPierre. Gun owners across America should be horrified by what I saw inside of the NRA. In his new book, Inside the NRA, Joshua Powell describes an organization rife with corruption. It is this, you know, incredible uh, a mess of malfeasance and self-dealing. He accuses LaPierre and other executives of misleading dues-paying members of the NRA and using their money to finance LaPierre's lavish lifestyle, including $542,000 for trips on private jets. It is an abomination of, of members' money that what's gone on over the past 30 years. It's to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars in wastage. It's possible crimes were committed, is what you're saying. If uh, fraud is a crime, that's correct. And I have, you know, there are some, there are a number of transactions that took place in that place that would fall into the category of fraud. There's no doubt about it. But Powell is under investigation himself for the same alleged malfeasance he says he's trying to expose. He's named in the New York Attorney General's lawsuit seeking to disband the NRA that alleges evidence of illegal conduct and inappropriate spending for which the NRA says he was ultimately fired. He denies the allegations. The allegations make you seem like part of the problem, though. 
I understand that, and I don't believe that's the case. Powell says he now supports some of the gun control measures he says his old boss worked tirelessly to block. He claims the NRA said no to any proposed solutions to the nation's gun violence problem it felt would restrict Second Amendment rights. The NRA does have blood on its hands, and it's taken me, frankly, a while to come to that uh, realization, but the reality of is that when you're standing in the middle of America and you're saying, no way are we going to allow any changes to this country as it relates to guns, and you're not a culture of, of solutions in solving gun crime, and gun crime is a problem, then you are the problem. And the NRA has blood all over its hands. Now, you realize when you say you can now support universal background checks, uh, red flag laws, uh, with the proper uh, adjudication in terms of due process, that you will be called the Judas of the RA. 100 percent. I am absolutely, that's, that's where we're there. Look, the NRA is going to do everything they can possibly do to discredit me. They're going to, they will attack me in the press, they will call me Judas, they'll accuse me of all these, uh, all these things to discredit me. The NRA calls Powell's accusations pure fiction and says that before he was fired for allegedly misusing funds, he endorsed everything the NRA was doing. And tonight, the New York AG's office tells ABC News that Powell's attorney has reached out, offering to cooperate with their investigation. An epic battle now underway. Kira? Pierre, thanks so much. And you can hear more of his exclusive interview next week on GMA. When we come back for the first time, we're seeing Jacob Blake since he was shot seven times by police. We'll have more on his court appearance and his condition. The monthly jobs report numbers are in. They are bad, but there are pockets of hope. We're going to take a closer look. Also up next, it's a topic that has consumed many people online, the state of Britney Spears' finances, what new court documents are revealing. Stay with us. The doorbell rings, and I see this teenager outside. That was the end of my life as I knew it. She shoots her in the face? What? So my dad is Joey Buttafuoco, and my mom is Mary Jo Buttafuoco. The name might ring a bell. Now, the story you thought could never yeah. get more surprising does. Most people think they know this story, but they have no clue, and it's crazy. The 2020 event, tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Ismael? David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks to meet you. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank, Thank you for sitting. Everything changed. Mother Nature setting the rules, and all I got to do is slay her game. Season of Life Below Zero, followed by the premiere of Next Generation, Monday, September 7th at 8 on National Geographic. You're tuned to AM790. It's a lovely day out there in God's country, so just sit back and enjoy that beautiful big sky. Now, with so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now, when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. Four days. That's how long this Minnesota man was pinned under a tree on his property. Jonathan Seplica lives in a very isolated area and was cutting down trees when he says one of them fell on his leg. Police were called to his home after they got a call that he hadn't shown up for work. Police say when they found him, he was surprisingly alert and that the former Iraq war vet knew exactly how long he had been trapped. Thankfully, he is okay now.
Well, one of the world's biggest stars has been getting a lot of attention recently. Britney Spears has been locked in a court battle over conservatorship with her personal affairs and finances. That conservatorship fueling the so-called Free Britney movement. And it's something Spears has seemed to acknowledge in these latest court filings. The Princess of Pop. Britney Spears, one of the best-selling female musical artists of all time, helped define the early 2000s. I want to thank Radio Disney so much for giving me their first ever Icon Award. I, what can I say? This is such an honor. But in recent years, her legal battles have stolen the spotlight with speculation over a court-ordered conservatorship, initially led by her father, Jamie. Little is known about the arrangement, but that could change. In recent court filings obtained by ABC News, a lawyer for Spears argues Brittany herself is vehemently opposed to this effort by her father to keep her legal struggle hidden away in the closet as a family secret. That conservatorship in place for 12 years, following Spears' very public meltdown, a time of crisis she's even sung about. The drama. Sources at the time revealed that she was battling bipolar disorder. Um, and so her father stepped in to, you know, take control of the situation as her conservator. And that really meant controlling both her finances and also her ability to make business deals because she had been dealing with some managers and some Hollywood characters who were trying to take advantage of her in her weakest state. So she really had to kind of um, go for the most comprehensive version of a conservatorship, which really meant controlling pretty much her everyday moves. But a lot has evolved since then. She has seemingly really gotten a lot of things under control. But my life has been so In this latest court filing, Britney's lawyer even appears to comment on the hashtag Free Britney movement, referencing an interview Spears' father gave where he dismisses the conspiracy theory. Writing, far from being a conspiracy theory or a joke, as James reportedly told the media, in large part, this scrutiny is a reasonable and even predictable result of James's aggressive use of the sealing procedure over the years to minimize the amount of meaningful information made available to the public. Her father, Jamie, sees it differently, telling the New York Post, I love my daughter, I love all my kids, but this is our business, it's private. It's up to the court of California to decide what's best for my daughter. For 10 years, it seemed as though everything was under control and Jamie was doing a fairly good job as the conservator and helping to bring stability to Britney's life. But there was some turmoil going on behind the scenes in that family. Jamie himself had some serious health problems. There was also an incident where Kevin Federline filed a police report um, claiming that Jamie had um, hit one of Britney's children. And she felt that he might have jeopardized her custody. And he was advised behind the scenes that he should step down from his role as the conservator. The whole family is still involved. Her reportedly massive fortune is in the hands of her younger sister in the event of Britney's death. Court documents show Jamie Lynn, the former Nickelodeon star. You want to be serious? Is now trustee of her big sister's estate and must ensure it's used to protect Britney's two children if she passes away. And Britney's mom attending a court hearing last year. Her mother telling the court she just wants to have a voice in her daughter's life. Spears' brother Brian even weighed in on Britney's experience speaking with Drew Plotkin on the podcast as not seen on TV. She's always wanted to get out of it. It's, you know, it's very frustrating to have, whether, whether it's, someone's coming in peace to help or they're coming in with, you know, an attitude like having someone constantly tell you to do something, it's got to be frustrating. So yeah, she's, she's wanted to get out of it for quite some time. And ABC has reached out to attorneys for both Britney Spears and her father. Both camps declined to comment. Still ahead here on Prime, Brianna Taylor's boyfriend interviewed for the first time as we're also seeing new home videos of the emergency worker who was gunned down by police. The new job on Jeopardy for its biggest champ, Ken Jennings. What he will now be doing with the show set to return on Monday.
and the unofficial end to summer means millions of people could be traveling, which begs the question, what are the current COVID hotspots? We'll break it down for you. The first our tweet of the day, one of the world's most famous athletes, Lionel Messi, stunning the soccer world and reversing course by declaring he is staying with the team he's played for since he was 13. coronavirus has affected so many of you. America has changed for now. There's no question about that. People are finding a way to come together. What else should people know about how to care for their families through this? And you feel it's not too late to flatten the curve? It's not too late. When do we expect to have a vaccine? George, we are all thinking of you, Allie, and the kids. How are you feeling? I feel fine, Robin. She wanted to share this message. You know I'm feverish if I'm on national television with no makeup on. Allie is now on the Roberts family prayer chain. Robin, how are you doing? I'm loving this. Oh, yeah. Keep these slippers on. We are so great that we get to do this from home. I'm going to take the camera and turn it around. <laughs> Kelly was doing prompter. You do know you're sideways, right? <laughs> Great to see so many Americans stepping up. All in this together. The world coming together as one. We're going to get through this together. Right here with you on Good Morning America. With America reopening, how can you stay safe, keep your family safe, and thrive? We all have so many questions. And that's why we're right here for you with What You Need to Know. So join us afternoons with What You Need to Know at 1 Eastern, 12 Central, and Pacific on ABC. Everything changes. Up here, there's only two kinds of people. Uncertainty is what I thrive on. I want to see if I could make it on my own. Those who are still standing and those fighting to survive. Mother Nature setting the rules, and all I gotta do is slay her game. That happened so quick. New season of Life Below Zero, followed by the premiere of Next Generation, Monday, September 7th at 8, on National Geographic. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. A family on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. As we head into Labor Day weekend, let's take a look at the COVID-19 hotspots and also some bright spots by the numbers. 187,464 people have now died from COVID-19 in the United States and 6.2 million cases have been diagnosed. Case counts exceed 600,000 in each of these states, California, Florida, and Texas, which have the highest case counts in the country. And Arizona with more than 205,000 cases and Mississippi with about 90,000 cases have among the highest case counts per capita. Some college campuses are also becoming hot spots. At least 10 colleges have had more than 1,000 cases each. But on a positive note, new COVID cases nationally declined for five straight weeks, except this week when they leveled off. And this Labor Day weekend, travel reservations to Florida have jumped 200%, even though it's now a COVID-19 hotspot. We still have much more to come here on Prime. Our conversation with the sole black owner of a horse competing in the Kentucky Derby and the pressure he's under to take a stand in the Breonna Taylor case. And equal work, equal pay, Brazil's soccer federation with the major announcement. But first, here are some of the trending stories on abcnews.com. Now could be a good time to have another baby. Are you crazy? I'm in love with you. Now that I said it out loud, it does sound weird. <laughs> I feel so Please stop. When I see you were so fine, I had to remind myself to breathe. I feel something when I see you. Let's do this. How's your quarantine going? <sighs> Tuesday night. I'm attracted to both men and women. I thought you were straight. Uh, I'm not straight. I'm bisexual, so I like girls and guys. What would you do if you overheard this? Look, I don't think you can like both. What our hidden cameras catch. I'm the same way. Yeah. It's not a thing. It's not a thing. It's not. 
Yeah. will blow you away. Why does it matter to you what his orientation is? Be his friend and support him. That's it. An incredible new two-hour What Would You Do special event starts at 9, 8 central on ABC. The waters of the Outer Banks are unforgiving and full of riches for the fishermen who dare. The best of the northern fleet are heading south. But the locals know where the giants lie. And if you thought the waters were unforgiving, wait until the battle begins. Wicked Tuna Outer Banks. New episode Sundays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, at this defining moment in America. So much on the line. We gonna be all right. Starting Tuesday night from ABC News, Turning Point, the groundbreaking month-long event. Every night, taking over, taking on. This moment for America. My America, your America, our America. This is Turning Point, the nightline month-long event. We gonna be all right. Starts Tuesday late night on ABC. I could have sat there and watched them kill a friend of mine of color. But I wasn't going to do that. The prime suspect in the death of a Trump supporter in Portland, Oregon, has been killed by federal agents. Investigators say they found Michael Rynell at home in Lacey, Washington, where he allegedly pulled out a gun, prompting agents to open fire. Federal agents said that he tried to flee, that he pulled a gun on them. That's why they had to open fire. And as a result, Michael Rynell was killed. Now, all of this ratchets up tension in this city ahead of a weekend that was already supposed to be explosive with BLM and Antifa activists going head to head with white nationalists and pro-Trump groups here. In Rochester, New York, protesters confronted police overnight, hours after seven police officers were suspended for the death of a black man. Hey. New York City last night, a car driving through a crowd of Black Lives Matter protesters in Times Square. No serious injuries reported. In a campaign speech meant to address the U.S. economy, former Vice President Joe Biden starting instead with a fiery response to explosive new allegations in Atlantic Magazine. The report alleging President Trump repeatedly disparaged U.S. soldiers killed and injured in combat. Biden referring to his late son, Beau, who died from cancer, but served in the military. He wasn't a sucker. The service men and women he served with particularly those who did not come home, were not losers. The Atlantic report cites four anonymous people with firsthand knowledge of the allegations, but ABC News has not independently confirmed any of the details. The president and his campaign outraged. It's a fake story and it's a disgrace that they're allowed to do it. The topic likely to continue to be part of the discussion on the campaign trail. Just two months until Election Day, eligible voters in North Carolina are the first in the nation to be getting absentee ballots. A reminder that the political season kicks into high gear after Labor Day weekend. Just hours after the August jobs report Friday, Biden on the attack. The Labor Department out with the jobs report for August. It shows the U.S. economy created about 1.4 million jobs last month. The unemployment rate dropping from just over 10 percent to under eight and a half. The fact that we got substantially below 10 percent on the unemployment rate down to 8.4 percent, I would call that a win. But we still need to remember that there are many Americans who are still unemployed out there. Early in the year, we lost some 20 million jobs. That was during March and April. And as we look Look now at the figures that have been accumulating. We still have to make back more than 11 million jobs just to get us back to where we were before. Two of soccer's highest profile nations have closed the gender pay gap of their national teams. Brazil and England say they are now paying their women's team the same amount of money as their men's team. That's in contrast to the U.S. Soccer Federation. The U.S. women's national teams sued the Federation, alleging gender discrimination in pay and working conditions. The unequal pay claims here dismissed in May. A trial involving the working conditions alleged allegations won't happen until next year. Jeopardy has announced its fall premiere date. Season 
Season 37 will premiere in syndication on Monday, September 14th. Longtime host Alex Trebek says he's feeling good, feeling excited, and glad to finally be getting out of the house. And the recently crowned greatest contestant of all time, Ken Jennings, will be joining the show as a consulting producer. Jennings, who still holds the record for the show's longest winning streak, will serve as the show's general ambassador behind the scenes, as well as presenting his own special video categories in upcoming episodes. Hey, welcome back. This holiday weekend will be a scorcher for millions of people. There are already concerns about the power grid in parts of California. A flex alert was issued asking residents in America's most populated state to conserve electricity from 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. And that's because temperatures are expected to soar into the triple digits, possibly breaking records and sparking fears about a new fire threat. Those concerns out west replaced with an eye on the tropics to the east. No storm is close to land, but our weather team is watching several systems in the Atlantic for possible development. For the first time since his shooting, because the latest flashpoint in a turbulent year, we are seeing images of Jacob Blake. Blake appeared from his hospital bed on video for a court hearing on domestic abuse charges, which he pleaded not guilty. The charges against him were filed earlier this year before he was shot seven times in the back by police. Because of an outstanding arrest warrant, when he was hospitalized, Blake was kept handcuffed to his bed. That warrant, though, was later vacated and the handcuffs removed. Blake's father says that he is now out of intensive care and doing better, but still can't move from the waist down. And tonight, George Washington University announcing that they are reviewing a post from one of their professors in which she allegedly claims, claims to have faked being black. The school saying that Jessica Krug will not be teaching her classes this semester. In a lengthy blog post, which ABC News has not verifi verified as written by Krug, she allegedly wrote that she is, quote, canceling herself after decades of deception. She allegedly admitted being born to white parents instead of being black and Latina, like she had claimed for being for many years. It's been 175 days since police killed Breonna Taylor, an emergency medical worker inside her home. Now in a new documentary, we're getting an exclusive look at the first interview with her boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, who was there the night that she was shot, as well as private family home videos. Steve Osinsami has more. People across this country are answering that call and saying her name, Brianna Taylor, the 26-year-old emergency medical worker who was shot to death in her own home by Louisville police, who now realize that they should never have been at her door in the first place. And this morning, we're getting an exclusive first look at the new documentary. The New York Times presents the killing of Brianna Taylor, retracing the events of the night she was killed. There were bullet holes everywhere. Brianna was a great person. And she didn't deserve what happened to her. She was more than a girlfriend. More than that. She's my best friend. Front and center is Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, in his very first interview. We met, I guess, on Twitter. <laughs> no matter how it started, we was always going to come back together. The film also shows exclusive home video of the couple. These two Mom. here, they might as well get married. Don't touch I have a family. You want to be my baby daddy? Ken Bree, just for the record, that was the girl name. It's Kenny and Bree mix. I like that. But, um, yeah, like everything was going really good. But on March 13th, everything changed with a bang on their door. Help! Oh, my God! Yeah, that's for you! What's your name, sir? It was late. So it was in between watch a movie and play Uno. And we decided to do both. We didn't make it halfway through the Uno game before she was falling asleep. The last thing she said was, turn off the TV. Next thing I remember is a loud bang at the door. They didn't know it right away, but it was the police charging through the door with a no-knock warrant signed by a judge. The police were looking for drugs that weren't there. Walker was legally carrying a gun and says he fired it in self-defense. The police shot back, killing Taylor, who was shot five times. One of the officers was shot in the leg, and at first they arrested Walker for attempted murder. You see him surrendering here, but those charges were later dropped. The charges brought against me were meant to silence me 
and cover up Brianna's murder. In this police interview after the shooting, you hear Walker insist this was the fault of the police and not his. It's the middle of the night and somebody's beating on the door and not seeing who they are. Like, you know, what are you going to do if you're home with, with your family and somebody's beating on your door and you don't know who it is after you've asked who it is? When the door comes off the hinges, it's just... It's happening fast, like it was like an explosion. Walker is now suing the city of Louisville and the Louisville police for assault, battery, false arrest, and malicious imprisonment. The FBI and Kentucky state authorities are still investigating. The director of this documentary says she hopes her film underlines the injustice that needs to be addressed in this case. The loss of this young woman's life is, is not just the loss of Brianna's life, but the loss of uh, her future with Kenny, the loss to her friends and her family. She was a mentor to, to people, to her friends. I mean, she was a young woman at the bloom of her life. And our thanks to Steve and the New York Times presents the killing of Breonna Taylor. It premieres tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific on FX and FX on Hulu. Well, protesters gathered today in Breonna Taylor's hometown of Louisville, Kentucky for the 100th straight day. And tomorrow, thousands of people are expected to protest outside the city's legendary Churchill Downs racetrack, where the 146th annual Kentucky Derby will be held with no fans. Many folks actually want it canceled. And there is one thoroughbred horse owner who's been under growing pressure now to pull out of the derby in protest of the killing of Taylor. He's Greg Harbett, co-owner of the horse Necker Island, and he's here with us now to talk more about the situation that's taking place. And we should point out, Greg, um, you know, as an African-American owner, uh, it's very special for you to have a horse uh, in this derby. Um, but what people may not know is that there is a history of African-Americans working in racing for more than 100 years, your family included. Let's talk about that legacy. Well, as you mentioned, uh, African-Americans have made a, a great contribution to the thoroughbred racing industry. Uh, the first Kentucky Derby uh, winner was actually trained by an African-American, Anson Williamson, as well as ridden by an jo African-American jockey named Oliver Lewis. Uh, my, cert uh, my family has certainly made great contributions to the industry. Uh, I'm a third-generation horseman. My great-grandfather was Will Harbert, who great gained great notoriety uh, with his association with Man of War. Uh, my grandfather, Tom Harbert, was a very successful uh, groomsman. Uh, in his era, and actually owned a Kentucky Derby winner and uh, Kentucky Derby participant in 1962 by the name of Touch Bar. And we should point out that in 1962, your grandfather Tom wasn't even allowed to sit in the stands. That's true. Uh, due to the civil unrest and the uh, social segregation, uh, even though he was the breeder as well as the co owner of the horse, uh, he was not allowed to be listed or uh, come to the grandstands uh, in that year. That's what makes this so much special as far as my participation with everything that's going on in the country with the civil unrest, uh, to bring awareness of the contributions that African-Americans before me have made to this industry and to show the world as well as the racing industry that African-Americans have made great contributions as well as letting the awareness be known that as African-Americans, we can participate in a sport and in an industry that's not necessarily inclusive and looks like us. And, and with that point, and I wanted to make that point, let's now talk about Breonna Taylor, who was killed by police there in Louisville. And you are the rare black horse owner in a sport that is among the whitest in America. Let's just be blunt about it. And now you're being called to boycott America's most famous race. How do you feel about that? And, and what do you say to those who are putting you under pressure to do so? Well, many have called for the boycott of the Kentucky Derby as well as Churchill Downs, but no one has necessarily reached out directly to call for the boycott of Necker Island. Uh, in fact, we have received great support from the African-American community as well as other civil leaders uh, to actually stand and participate, stay in the race, and represent the African-American community in a, in a sport in which we have a long story history. So... What, what are you saying to those, though, that think that you, you shouldn't be there, that you shouldn't stand there and be present, and, and you should be out protesting? 
Uh, for those who say that we should not be here, I would encourage them to look at the Kentucky history. As I've stated before, Kentucky Derby history begins with African Americans. Uh, we have been erased uh, from those history books as of late. Uh, but Ray Daniels, as well as myself, have set out to bring more African Americans into this business, to educate African Americans, to share our history in this great sport, and to show that we can be participants in a sport that has otherwise not been inclusive to us as of late. Uh, this is a great sport. It's a $100 billion industry a year. It employs over 1 million individuals a year. And we should have a piece of this industry. Uh, when you look at the overall business uh, structure of successful companies, every business that is successful uh, is a diversified and inclusive company. Point well made. So let me ask you then, do you think athletes in the NBA and Major League Baseball were justified in boycotting games in support of the Black Lives Matter movement? Because their circumstances are, are different than yours. I think every individual has the right to make the stance that they deem best for them. Uh, as I've stated before, uh, my partner as well as myself, we stand with Black Lives Matter and we stand for justice for Breonna Taylor. And each individual has to take the approach that they deem that is best for them. But I think overall, there's a consensus amongst all of us uh, that we want justice for Breonna Taylor and her family. Final question, uh, Greg. There's been a debate about whether to continue the century-old tradition of singing the state song, My Old Kentucky Home, uh, at the race this year. It was announced today that the song will be played but modified and then will be preceded by a moment of silence and reflection. Is this the right decision? I think it is the right decision at this particular time. I think uh, Churchill Downs has a great board of directors. I think once we get past uh, this Kentucky Derby, I believe those board members as well as others can hopefully meet, uh, have a discussion, and come to reconciliation that may work for all parties involved as far as the future of the song and the direction that Churchill Downs will take. Greg Harbett, sure appreciate your time, and I'm going to be keeping my eye on Necker Island tomorrow. <laughs> Best of luck to you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Well, for those of you thinking about a new puppy during this pandemic, you better watch out. The increase in puppy shopping online, it's creating more opportunities for scammers. Complaints about pet fraud have more than tripled from last year, according to the BBB. Our Will Reeve has more. These adorable pugs, known as the Pugdashians, are Instagram stars. But according to their owner, they're also popular with scammers. Their photos stolen and used on websites advertising dogs that don't exist. I'm contacted almost daily. My pictures on sites that are being are selling puppies. The Better Business Bureau warning the biggest increase in online shopping fraud is pet scams. It's nearly one out of every four online scams reported to the agency. The chances of being ripped off are just staggeringly high. The attorneys general in Michigan and North Carolina also alerting, don't fall for COVID-19 puppy scams. Warning, once customers send money, it's almost impossible to get back. It's a crime that can also be heartbreaking. Buffy Coleman says she thought she'd found a pet for her daughter Anaya's birthday. She loves pets. She's very energetic. She loves being outside. Um, so we figured what better way to release some of the energy but go ahead and invest in a, you know, a family dog for her. Instead, the Richmond, Virginia mother says she lost $500, never got the dog, and now she's desperately searching for another. As a mother, you know, it's like when somebody takes from your child. To avoid fraud, experts say ask to see the dog in person first if you can do so safely. Also, search for the dog's photo online. If it appears on multiple sites, it's most likely fraud. And avoid wiring money. More recently, the uh, pet scammers have started demanding gift cards. No legitimate business takes payment in gift cards. And consider reaching out to a local animal shelter to foster or adopt a pet. And our thanks to Will for that. And some of the dogs that are in high demand, well, French Bulldogs and Yorkshire Terriers. If you want one of those breeds, you'll need to be especially careful. And still to come, do you go on TikTok to see your therapist? We 
all have so many questions, and that's why tonight Nightline is there for you, helping you and your family through this crisis. The good information you need at the end of the day. Nightline tonight at 11:35, 10:35 Central on ABC. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier Podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source of ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere, right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Now, with so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now, when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. Take a look at this emotional moment. That's Jose Guerrero being discharged from a hospital in Queens, New York. We've seen a lot of scenes like this so many times that what makes this so remarkable is that Jose has been getting treatment in that hospital since March. The staff lined the hospital corridors to cheer him off. We love seeing images like this. Well, Sunday starts National Suicide Prevention Week, and with everything going on right now, it's never been more important to take care of your mental health. So we want to introduce you to the latest social media superstar using TikTok to tackle the stigmas associated with mental health. And, oh yeah, we really like his dance moves, too. Our Will Gans has the story. Here. What's up, everyone? I have a tool I want you guys to put in your toolbox. Check it out. Dr. Marquise Norton is a licensed counselor and professor at Hampton University who's starting a new conversation about mental health and wellness. As a therapist, I get asked this question all the time. But Dr. Norton's moving that talk to TikTok. You know, the stigma is removed. That's really what my, my ultimate goal is. It's to try to remove the stigma of mental health. Sharing advice on things like how to be more assertive. Recognizing alcohol abuse. <laughs> or even just improving your week. But why has the doc moved to TikTok? It's just a catchy song. It's you know, it's creative, it's fun, it's it's funny, so it's not as intimidating as if I were to, you know, do a lecture. Hold on. I like this beat, this groovy bag. I heard Corona hitting hard, I need a Gucci mask. Cajun style seafood boy like the juicy crab. He's racked up more than a million likes and hundreds of thousands of followers. I would say the engagement is the, the biggest um, surprise. I've never been a huge, uh, you know, influencer and, and, <laughs> and, and yeah, I've always been pretty low key and under the radar. But it offers Dr. Norton an important opportunity. Cotton candy, I like them sweat. Ooh, 12 inches is a feat. I'm with the gang, I'm with the fleet. Individually, in person, I can help people on an individual level. I think with social media, I can take those skills and multiply it to whatever the algorithm allows. What have been some of the more surprising moments since you started putting that content on the platform? A lot of the feedback is like, I didn't know that they had like young black therapists. Dr. Norton is hoping his message in particular might reach communities who wouldn't hear it otherwise. TikTok is a 16 to 24 year old base. If you're not talking to your parents and 
you're not around positive influence, it's, it's really easy to be displaced. So just trying to come, especially as a male, especially as a black male, you know, trying to be positive and, you know, talk about mental health. When you can't make decisions, it may be a good time to, to work with a professional. What is the, the overall message you hope folks take away after stumbling across your TikTok page or, or hearing something that you have to say? My goal, you know, to have these conversations about mental health provide some education, allow people that platform and that community to where we could talk about these experiences and there's not as much judgment. Our thanks to Will Gans and Doc, we love you too. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, no new worlds, those words, part of an art installation attracting guests in Plymouth, UK. It's meant to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the sailing of the Mayflower. The story of that ship is one that we all know. The transatlantic voyage brought more than 100 pilgrims or migrants from Europe to the Americas and history was changed forever. Well, that's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live and more con for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Kira Phillips, and thank you so much for streaming with us. Good night.